Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you all to the worship of God here at Westminster. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this day. However you found us, we're glad you're here. At the end of the pews, you'll find a uh, pew pad, and we ask that you sign your name and pass it on down to those that you're worshiping with today. And also in front of you in the pew racks are prayer request cards. If you have a prayer request, please fill out one of the cards, and those will be collected during the singing of our second hymn. There are also visitor cards in the pew racks. If you're a first-time visitor, we ask that you fill one of those out and place it in the offering plate as the offering is taken. Uh, today is a special day in the life of the congregation in that we are having lunch and we are talking about um, sort of the future of the funds that we have been using to pay off the mortgage. And we also need to hear from you about what your plans are in um, continuing with payments that have been used for the mortgage. So we're going to talk, we're going to have lunch, and uh, I know that many of you have signed up for this, and we are grateful for that. I also know that many of you have not signed up for this, and you're in trouble. <laughs> but uh, we will have lunch for you. Somehow this always works out. And uh, so just hang around after church today. We'll gather up in the fellowship hall and uh, have lunch. So um, you'll also be picking up a survey and sort of a pledge survey card that doesn't have your name on it, but it does give you a chance to say what your intention is for uh, future support for the mission of the congregation. It's a little hard to plan if we don't know what we have. And so we're asking you to help us know what we have. There are other announcements, and I invite announcement people to come forward at this time. Okay, I won't ask for a show of hands who's read their bulletin. Oh, God, there's one. Okay. It's not the first Sunday of the month. It's the second Sunday. I can still count. But Faith in Films is tonight at 6. We're showing Marshall, which sh documents the life, the early lawyer life of Thurgood, Thurgood Marshall, who was our first black Supreme Court justice. So come. It's a pretty good film. And the price is right, 50 cents, popcorn, soda, candy. See you there. Good morning. Um, we will have the um, sign-up sheet available after church for the Lenten Bible study that uh, CODA is doing. We will meet after church every Sunday during Lent, 1130, um, to discuss um, this Bible challenge. It's a devotional um, that's a 40-day, so you'll read a small thing every day during uh, Lent. So please sign up so that we know how many books to get. The books are provided to you. Thank you. We have a wonderful opportunity um, for anybody that's interested. We are going to go see La Traviata, Traviata um, on March 13th. Um, we're going to take the train, have tickets, have probably a light supper downtown, and take the train home. Our very own Bill Du Bois has been cast in that play in two acts, and we're going down to see Bill. There he is. <laughs> and so we would like to know if anyone would like to go. The only thing is, is we need a commitment today with money. And um, so, you know, you got a lot of time, but it would be March 13th. We'd probably leave here in the 4 o'clock range and take the 1040. I think the play gets, or the opera's over at like 10. We can make the 1040. So if anybody would like to go see me after church or Stephen after church, and we will get you on the list. Um, but it'll be fun. And Bill, break a leg. <laughs> Well, I'm excited to see Bill in Act 2 because he plays a bull in the scene in Act 2. And speaking of bull, this is no bull. 
Tuesday is the last day for us to sign up for our April trip to Lancaster, Pennsylvania and make this announcement for Joanne and the Atumners, but you don't have to be an Atumner to come with us to Lancaster. Uh, we're going to Philadelphia, we're going to Gettysburg National Park, and we're going to the famous Sight and Sound Millennium Theater to see a production of Jesus. And you've heard me before, I'll say you can see Jesus walk across the water. Uh, you don't have to go with him, uh, but you'll see him out on the stage walk across the water, which is a pretty miraculous theatrical accomplishment, I will say. And I've seen it, and I hope you'll come with us. And I have to make those final payments on Tuesday, so be sure to see me or Joanne today. Good morning. Good morning. The, the deacons are sponsoring a chili dinner Friday, February 22nd at 5.30. Uh, there will be a sign up by the Valentines for you guys to sign up today. Um, it helps us to gather counts. And so we hope to see everyone Friday the 22nd at 5.30. Come out and help fight the winter blues. In your uh, bulletin today, we have a bulletin insert about the Women of Westminster's uh, blanket program for the, uh, the needy folks within our country and throughout the world. If you uh, choose to give to this uh, worthwhile fund, please make your check out to Women of Westminster or just WWOW. Thank you. We are in need of two people who would be willing to usher the first Sunday of the month on a regular basis. We are also in need of two people who would be willing to usher the third Sunday of each month on a regular basis. If this is something you can and would like to do, why please see me after church. Thank you. Let's stand up and greet one another. Good morning. Good morning. Please remain standing if you are able and join me in the call to worship projected on the screens in front of you or printed in your bulletin. Great is the Lord. Exalted among the nations. Mighty is the Lord. The ruler of heaven and earth. Holy is the Lord. Beyond our understanding, let us worship our God.
amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. O oh, gracious and gentle God, God of peace and comfort, we confess before you the evil of our hearts. We acknowledge that we are <coughs> feelings that often give rise to bitterness between us and others. Forgive us our sin and permit us to partake of the blessing you have promised to those who seek your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all God's people say, words of assurance. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory be to God. Amen. Our Lord Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets.
exactly the right number of these. Whoa. I'm gonna give each one of you one of these, and I'm going to have you help me out with something. Yes, we're going to hear a story in the Bible today. The gospel reading has to do with fishing. And so, yeah, it's a magnet. I brought you each a fishing pole. And I, yeah, that's why you, better than hooks, right? Yes. Magnets we can do. Hooks, we would have had a problem. Yes, good. So I'm going to have you, <laughs> woo, losing control. I'm going to have you go ahead, and I want you to put your pole in there and see what you catch. Okay? Go see what you can catch. And don't tell anyone yet. I'm going to have you Tell me in just a minute. Okay. Measy, can you get one? We'll unroll it a little bit and see what you can find. Nope, just one, Eric. Just one. There we go. Okay. So we will start with JT. JT, what did you catch? A big fish, yeah. That's pretty typical. You would find a fish. How about you? Jackson caught a boot. Oh, sometimes that happens, too. You hope it doesn't, but it happens. And Aiden caught a fish. And Eric, what did you catch? I caught a medium fish. Good. And Maisie, what did you catch? A person? What? Now, you can catch fish. And you do go fishing for fish. And sometimes you might catch a boot, or you might even catch some seaweed. But catching a person? Hmm, kind of strange. But in our gospel reading today, Jesus tells people he is going to teach them to go fishing for people. Hmm, but he didn't mean fishing like we just did. He meant something different. So I'm going to see if I can help you understand what he meant. So. During the time that this happened, these people were fishermen, and it was their job to catch fish. So they didn't use poles like we just used, because then they would only catch one fish at a time, and they would never catch enough fish to make a living. So what they would do is they would go out in their boat onto the Sea of Galilee at nighttime when it was dark, and they would throw down their nets in the water, and then they would shine a light and the schools of fish down below would be attracted to that light. And they would swim up, and they could pull up the net and catch lots and lots of fish. Well, one day, or one night, they had some really bad luck, and no fish got in their net. No fish were attracted. And they came back, and Jesus was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he was teaching this crowd of people the crowd kept getting closer and closer, and they couldn't hear him very well because there were so many people around him. So he asked one of the fishermen named Simon Peter, he said, would you take me out a little bit on your boat, and then I can teach from there, and then we'll have a little space and people can hear about it. And so Simon Peter did that, and then after Jesus was done teaching the people, he said, Simon Peter, take your boat out a little bit farther and then put your nets over the side. And Simon Peter said, uh, Jesus, we were out there all night and we didn't catch a thing. I don't think it's gonna help. But then he looked at Jesus' face and he said, uh, but if you think it's a good idea, we'll give it a try. <laughs> so they did and they threw their nets over the side and almost right away they had so many fish in their net that they couldn't even pull it up. The boat started to sink. And they were just tons and tons of fish, and they were so surprised. And they decided right then that they were going to follow Jesus. And Jesus said, you know what? Up until this point, you have been fishing for fish, but I'm gonna teach you how to fish for people. And what he meant was, there's a whole world out there of people who were kind of in the darkness people who didn't know how much God loved them, and they didn't know about Jesus. And so he was going to teach these people to go out and bring the light of Christ out there and bring people into God's family.
And that's something we can all still do too. We can be fishers for people. We can bring people into God's family by sharing God's love with them. So when we're kind to people, when we help people who need it, when we pray for people, we are spreading God, Christ's light in that world and we are bringing people into God's family. Will you say a prayer for it with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for teaching us how to be fishers for people too. Help us to spread your love wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today's Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. A vision of God in the temple. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is utterly desolate until the Lord sends everyone far away, and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak when it is, whose stump remains standing when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Our response is Psalm 147, number 549 in your hymnal.
Reading from the New Testament, we read from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth and says, Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. And then turning to the Gospel of Luke, we read from chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The word of the Lord. If you have a prayer request, we ask that you hold up your prayer request card so that the ushers can collect them as we sing our next hymn.
Let us pray. Gracious God, as we come to your word, open our hearts. Make us eager to receive your message. And having been shaped by your word, help us step into your world and live as your people. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. James Alfred Wright wrote under the pen name James Herio. And he wrote a number of stories about his experiences as a veterinarian in the hill country of Great Britain. He also talked about how his life was shaped in that time and living there in the countryside. He'd been raised in the city and he found himself uh, learning both his craft and learning something about the people around him. He graduated from veterinary school during the height of the depression and he was so glad to just get a position that he didn't give a lot of thought to where he landed. It was a job and that was what he needed. Um, along the way, he becomes interested in a young woman that's in the country, and he decides, well, it's time to take her out. He wants to make a good impression. Only he discovers that his only really good suit of clothes is now several years old, and it looks kind of odd, and it doesn't fit. And then he also discovers that the car he's going to use doesn't actually have brakes <laughs> and finally they go out on a rainy night they cross the road and here he is in this ill-fitting suit of clothes she's dressed up and looks he said like a jewel and they wind up having to push the car out of the water it is perhaps the worst first date ever and it will be a while before he ever gains nerve enough to ask her out again. He didn't feel like he was worthy of her attention, and so he just kind of slinked away and hid in his veterinary practice. His colleagues noticed how grumpy he was after this event, and they kept saying, you've got to quit pining for this woman. Make a fresh start. Well, eventually they get married, so that wasn't very good advice. But it's interesting how if we don't feel like we are worthy, if we don't feel like we fit or belong, we stay away. We try to avoid. And there's this experience in the text that we heard today of people who didn't feel worthy of being in God's presence and they were concerned about whether or not they could measure up. We heard the call story of the prophet Isaiah in the first scripture reading we heard from the Old Testament. And it's not only a call story, but it's also an encounter with the actual presence of God. Isaiah is in the temple, and suddenly God appears to him. His hem fills the temple, it says, the hem of his garment. He's attended by angelic beings. And Isaiah is suddenly aware in the presence of God's holiness that he is a person that just doesn't fit in with the picture. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. I am lost. I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. There's an experience in which he's consecrated for his task, and he's finally sent on his way with an eagerness that uh, is so inspiring. Here I am, Lord, send me. And then when he's finally given the task, he has sort of a different response. But we should note the eagerness. We should be moved by that. And uh, I think we should also recognize God's sarcasm in this passage. It's pretty striking. At one point when Isaiah is saying, well, okay, so now I'm consecrated, I've been set apart, I've been given this special call, 
what should I do? And he says, keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes. Well, that's kind of a crummy message to be giving and kind of a low estimate of the people he's preaching to. And suddenly the one who said, here I am, Lord, send me, is saying, how long, O oh Lord? How long? And then the Lord's answer is no more encouraging. Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is utterly desolate. Until the Lord sends everyone far away and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Wow. Uh, kind of a, a hard call there. And an interesting reminder that Isaiah has never promised that this message is going to succeed. In fact, he's told it's likely going to fall on deaf ears. And yet your faithfulness is still expected. The second story we heard was um, around the Sea of Galilee. Jesus has been preaching there. The fishermen are cleaning their nets. And if you go to the Sea of Galilee, there's an actual spring where fresh water bubbles up a little bit from shore, and the Sea of Galilee has a little bit of salt water in it. And so if you were going to actually clean your nets, this is a place that you'd go, is you'd seek out this freshwater spring to clean the nets. And so you can envision this place. Here they are, doing their work, and Jesus says, go keep doing the same thing you have done that was not successful. And uh, Peter's a little taken aback at this advice, but he goes ahead and does it, and suddenly the success is overwhelming. And he can hardly uh, reconcile this with the fact that here he is, he's just an ordinary guy. He's a sinner after all. And now, something new is expected of him. Go away from me, he says. And I wonder how many times in our own lives of faith we've said, go away from me. Lord, go someplace else. Look for somebody else. Go away from me. And having said this, having been fearful of the thing that we have encountering in God's presence. There's a word of reassurance that comes from Jesus. Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. Uh, my guess is the fish were easier to manage. Don't you suppose that it was a little easier when he was doing the trade that he'd grown up in, and now Jesus says, do not be afraid, and we think, well, it's exactly the people you ought to be afraid of. I mean, the fish aren't so bad. But Jesus' reassurance that says, doing my work, you will find resources that you didn't know you had. You will be blessed in ways that you cannot imagine. Well, all of that offers a powerful reassurance these two stories, when taken together, are a reminder that God calls regular people to extraordinary tasks. That we don't know when we might be the one who actually steps into God's presence and encounters God in the Holy Temple. And we don't know when we might be the one who are given a special commission to hold up God's word to the world. And whether it's ignored or whether it's heard, whether it's responded to and lots of people are caught, in any event, the call comes to regular people in ordinary circumstances that God suddenly puts in an extraordinary place to do God's good. It's easy to say this is Bible stuff, and it happened a long time ago, and has nothing to do with me. But the truth is just the opposite. 
It's our stuff. It's for now. And it has everything to do with us as we live out our life in the faith. God will call. God will provide the resources. And we are the ones that can move ahead in his service. It's interesting to note that the success that the disciples came, came on the heels of failure. There are plenty of times when we will cast out the nets and they will come back empty. And it's exactly those experiences, those times, that move us to be more faithful people. It's in the hard parts. It's in the difficulties. It's in the empty nets that our faith is stretched and tested. It's in those hard words that Isaiah was given to say to the people that the stretching of faith allows for God's wondrous thing to occur. That's where the hope comes in. That's where God's faith can build us up. It's not always going to work. It's not always going to be easy. And yet, the call and claim on us remain the same and move us ahead to a greater faithfulness. In the passage we heard from 1 Corinthians today, there was a comment about all the people that had borne witness to the risen Christ. And Paul makes a point of saying, in the chapters preceding this, everything hands, hangs on our trust in the resurrection, in the promise that God will do a new thing. That's where our faith lies, and that's where we have a message to give to the world. Christ is risen, and in that message, there is life and hope that can hardly be calculated. And then he goes on to say, and look at all these people who saw it. And he points out that the living gospel is borne witness to by ordinary people. There's a whole bunch of people that have heard this message and seen it. And because of that, you have a message to proclaim. That part hasn't changed. We have a word to say and to figure out the place to say it and how to say it is always the task of the church. I think it's interesting. Um, one of the visions actually occurs in the church. It's in the temple, the holiest place. And the other call story occurs away from the synagogue, out in a workplace. It can be either way. And probably the church needs more than anything else to figure out how to do both things. How to be a place of sanctuary for the world and how to step out into the world and say the message that God has for us. That message about new life, about resurrection, about hope that doesn't quit, about God's call and claim on us that is both a claim for service and for salvation. All of those things are a promise that doesn't diminish, that doesn't change, but instead proves to be the foundation for ourselves and for our faith. Let us stand and affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We have these prayer requests from the congregation today. Someone is asking uh, for prayers for a friend who is in the final stages of cancer for strength and support for his family. There's a prayer request for the family of Gary Devine. Uh, Gary passed away suddenly on Thursday. Uh, there's a prayer of thanksgiving there was reconciliation with my son after seven years of estrangement. Uh, and then someone asked for prayers for their mother who was recently hospitalized with a number of health concerns. Um, we continue to pray for Nancy Henry. She's been uh, relocated to a care center in Geneva. She's in the final stages of pancreatic cancer pray for her and for her family. With these concerns in mind, let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we lift before you those concerns mentioned this day. We pray for those facing death and loss. We pray for those with health concerns. We pray for those who have found a way to reconciliation after long periods of estrangement. Hear us as we raise those concerns that are dear to our heart now. Now, as our Savior has taught us, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us offer our gifts to God.
God, <clears throat> let us pray. Yours, O oh Lord, are grandeur and power, majesty, splendor, and glory. All in the heavens and on the earth is yours, and of your own we give you. Bless these gifts and those who offer them. May they speak the hope of your kingdom and the joy that we have in Jesus Christ to all the world. Amen. In the narthex, there's an envelope with your name on it, and you will need to stop by the table to pick it up before you go on in to uh, have lunch. So stop by that table in the narthex. And now go in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you from this time forth and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Uh, before